aside from bringing up the idea that little boys and little girls just naturally like different things, responders to feminist frequency also used corporate profit as an argument. They did this in basically four ways. Number one, using profit as a defense in a won't somebody please think of the corporations way. Number two, claiming that boys are a bigger demographic and thus where the money is. Number three, denying that corporations are morally responsible for their actions and should not have to morally justify what they do. Number four, sex sells. Companies in the entertainment and video game industry exist so that they can make money. They are for-profit industries. And she does not provide any incentive for these companies to do so. It's as if she herself wants the marketing to be a certain way regardless of whether or not the marketing works or not, and then wants the company to take on more risk than they have to and ignore basic market research techniques. And granted, it may be reinforcing some stereotypes, but you can't get on the company's ass just because they're trying to make money. It's not that the companies are trying are specifically going out to reinforce some kind of patriarchal or misogynistic agenda. They're simply trying to market their products to whoever's going to buy them. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world, and they're trying to survive. They're having a slower margin to market to, they have to market to younger and younger kids, they have to do more aggressive marketing, they have to do more gender specific marketing, and it's not the fault of the toy companies, they're trying to survive. They're simply trying to sell their product, I figure. The first issue, that of corporate profit, might indeed explain why companies operate the way they do. However, this only excuses their actions if you believe that making a profit is more important than something's social impact. Feminist Frequency is putting forward the radical notion that companies should be called to be socially responsible. The main demographic for Lego is 5 to 14 year old boys. That's where the money is. The Lego company, as it says in the name, is a company. They're here to make money. That is their fucking job. Plus, all the things you listed out are directed towards a particular demographic, and evidently, this is the larger demographic since Lego is trying to market to it. You know, if, if the girls liked playing Lego as much as boys, they'd market it to girls, because Lego only care about making a profit, they're not trying to be sexist. The idea that the male demographic is larger for anything other than cultural reasons is absurd. Half the population is male-female, and a small percent is other. What explains this idea that boys are where the money is? Do boys have more money than girls? Do parents spend more money on their male children than female children? Is it easier to sell Legos to boys in a culture where girls are encouraged to play with dolls and glitter? This goes right back to the issue of gender roles and whether or not certain things naturally appeal to boys or girls. See my previous video. No, I think the advertisers are probably thinking something like, Will this shit sell this shit? If it does, that is good. If it doesn't, then we have failed, etc. They're probably not into the whole moralizing thing. Lego, and any other corporation for that matter's main goal is to make money. Unfortunately, breaking down gender barriers does not fulfill this task. I mean, if she came to these companies with some kind of economic, economic marketing strategy that would help the companies uh, and uh, appeal to women and help their profits, then these companies would listen. But until then, they are not changing anything. Isn't every other female toy covered in pink and purple? Why does this suddenly make Lego a bad company for doing what everybody else is doing? They're trying to market towards girls, so they're covering their product in a stereotypical girl color. What's the big deal? It's important to respect the fact that the free market will always have its way. If there's a market for sexualized women, <laughs> if there's a market for sexualized women and hyper-sexualized men, the free market will have its way. So to say that it is a conspiracy against women, against women to keep them down, is ridiculous. As if porn was, porn predates the Bible, all right? So uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is the free market says fuck you. So corporations are amoral. Does that mean we are powerless against them? Does their need to make a profit have no limits? Where we are willing to draw the line on corporate profit making reflects our cultural values. The argument that the free market will always have its way is transparently false. Slavery, child pornography, and murder for hire are but a few of the things that people are willing to pay for but are rightly prohibited. 
While objectification of women may not be on the same level as those, my point is that the idea that moral considerations play no role in the market is both false and dangerous. And then there's always the sex sells argument. This, this has been going on forever. This is how people market and sell, but it's proven that sex sells. People like looking at attractive people. It's really that simple. You want to know why men and women are both sexualized, not even just in video games, but in media in general? Because sex sells. That is the bottom line. You see, at the end of the day, a company is trying to get you to buy their product. And since sex sells, they're going to sell you sex, which is why porn makes a lot of money. Sex sells because of our collective failure to fight against what is, at the end of the day, our own manipulation. Something that struck me about this line of argument against feminist frequencies is that it involves a kind of double think. If asked about advertising as an issue separate from the gender debate, people generally have a cynical attitude about advertising. They understand that ads are trying to manipulate them. However, when it's convenient for them, such as attacking feminist frequency, then suddenly people rush to defend advertising. It's important to keep in mind that modern advertising grew out of the political propaganda system. Once upon a time, most advertising made more or less rational appeals to the consumer. They would boast that their product was cheaper or better than their competitors. But what political propagandists who later entered public relations and advertising industries realized is that people were driven by irrational desires. Advertising shifted to being image-based and centered around creating psychological compulsion in the consumer for a product. Sex, being one of the most powerful of human drives, became a tool of selling unrelated products. There is a double hypocrisy when so-called rational thinkers defend the advertising industry because they're defending an industry based on promoting irrational behavior. Yes, sex sells, but is it for the right reasons? Will we not be promoting a more rational society by demanding that people appeal on reason rather than emotion? This reminds me of the liquor store near my old apartment. The store had these life-size cutouts of women in bikinis with large large breasts holding bottles of liquor and even as a man I always felt insulted by these because basically what they're saying is that I'm so stupid that I will buy anything as long as they put a pair of breasts in the advertisement and as long as the content is legal and it's not blatantly ridiculously offensive and they make money they will continue to do it because very offensive things don't even get to get on TV they get shut down before they even appear on there so without a profit, this stuff wouldn't exist, and she wouldn't be able to complain about it in the first place. But it doesn't occur to her to get to the root cause, or the, the root of what's going on there, because that would be too much trouble. Indeed, we have arrived at the root of the issue. If people actually took offense to sexism in the way that they do towards racism and homophobia, then corporations would be forced to change where people just let it go on. On one hand, you have people acting as if what corporations do is an unstoppable force of nature. On the other hand, we actually have someone acknowledging that they can be forced to change if the public demands it. Yet, somehow women aren't up in arms. They aren't organizing protests and boycotts and online campaigns. While they may not come out and say it, a lot of men are all too happy to have sexualized images of women everywhere and people generally accept it as the status quo. Record labels have a goal of trying to get their artists to stick out of the crowd in an oversaturated media landscape. For decades, they've been making sexualized, shocking, violent media products. More and more, we see the industry cynically relying on sensationalism and glamorization of violence against women in order to boost sales. It's important to remember that GQ is a business whose sole desire is to make a profit in selling magazines, and more importantly, in selling the ad space inside their magazines. They know that these images will appeal to their male audience. They know that it will cause a controversy, and they don't care, nor do they take any responsibility for promoting and encouraging images of sexualized young people. And they don't care about the larger social impact that that has. 